Good morning, everybody. Are you all ready to worship God?
Praise God. Amen. Welcome, Church on the Move. We're so happy to have you here with us today. We had some uh, birthdays take place that I wanted to make note of. Uh, Pat Connolly turned 60 years old. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. And Mia, Mia did not turn 60. She turned 12. Yeah. Congratulations, Mia. And uh, also, if I'm missing anybody, I'm really sorry, but I know one in particular I wanted to do. One special one, because they're not here, but I think they're probably watching. So go ahead and zoom in. Go ahead and, and frame me in. You got it? Okay. How's that look? All right. Perfect. Joanna, happy birthday. Yeah. It is, it's so, she's such a great girl. Uh, our kids are awesome. Uh, and if you haven't noticed here at Church on the Move, we have our kids in here with us during worship. Uh, before they go downstairs, because it's important for them to worship the Lord, and it's important for them to see us do it as well. Amen? So they are here. We're part of a great big family, and Joanna does so much being a pastor's kid. That can be a very tough a tough gig, right? So uh, she helps a, helps a lot and does a lot with her parents, everything from cleaning the church to who knows what, and uh, we're very thankful for her. So happy birthday, Joanna. Yeah, she's an awesome, awesome girl. Uh, so for our offering today, we started to have the kids take offering last week at Easter, and it went so beautifully, uh, and it went smooth, and it went grind up every week, and they'll be ready to go, and then I realized Naomi's not here today, okay? <laughs> so here's what we're going to do for offering. We're going to revert a little bit. We're going to go back. There's those buckets in the back. You can also give online at cotmmt.com, which many of you are. Uh, you can drop off in the foyer. Uh, everything that is given back to the Lord, because it's all His to begin with, will be put into this community and put into ministry and reaching people and letting them know the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's a hurting world, and they need to know about Him. Okay, for our announcements today, Judy is going to come up and give us our announcements. We love her. Been a fabric of this church for a long time, and uh, we just love her. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know when I started church here. The first time I started came on a Sunday. They honored Pastor Jim's wife, Renee's birthday. Now, is that in July? It is in July. And I can't remember what year that was. I can only remember uh, dates like who died and what, who got married. No, I'm kidding. I sound like uh, one of the stars in, in um, Hollywood. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's when I divorced so-and-so. That happened, da, 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 and that's when I got married. Da, da. You know, that's, I, that's how they tell time. I tell time by how many kids I've had and when they were born. After they were born, I didn't count anymore. So anyway, praise the Lord. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. Um, there's a game night coming up on April 19th at 6 p.m. Um, you can bring a, a game to do and snacks. Leave the game at home. Bring the snacks. Because, no, I'm kidding. Bring your snacks. Bring your game. And intermingle and enjoy each, everybody, the fellowship. And I just praise the Lord that we have that opportunity. We don't have to hide in a dungeon or uh, rip up a Bible and, get, and give somebody a... I heard, heard this is happening in, in the Russia area. <clears throat> They rip up the Bible, and each person gets one page, and then they meet again and switch pages. Now, I hadn't thought about learning the Bible that way, but it might work. I don't know. I doubt it, but no, I'm kidding. God's Word never fails, and if they're reading even one page, they're going to be blessed. So praise the Lord. <clears throat> um, the ladies are meeting at <clears throat> Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. downstairs. Uh, they were learning about overcoming, living as an overcomer, and it's a good study. I, I'm not too fond of reading a lot of books. I basically stay with the Bible, but this is a good, good study. So whoever chose it did well. So we thank you. So that starts at, at 10 a.m. in the morning on Wednesdays. Ladies, you're welcome to come. And if you get here an hour early, you can join us in uh, prayer. We have intercessory prayer at 9 o'clock. So God is on the move, and praise the Lord. Coffee shop opens at 9.30 on Sunday mornings, and there's another game night 
coming up in May. So come and enjoy the one April so you'll know how much fun you're going to have in May, right? So I just praise the Lord. And I thank God for each and every one of you that are here today. You are not here by accident. God has some blessing for you from the uh, music or from pastor, probably pastor. He's been preaching some really good stuff, you guys. So come and listen to our pastor. And I'm feeling led today to, to just give a little Bible scripture thing. And I haven't gone out on my back porch and practiced reading this like I used to do when I had kids' church. So help me with this because... Some of us are going through some trials and tribulations. Some of us, and I'm sure, are having something in their lives that is difficult to go through. And so I was amazed when I read that we are to glory in our tribulations. Look at Romans 5, 2. We are to glory in that. We have access to God because the grace he has given us, and we are to stand in that grace. And by faith, we receive this. So that kind of surprised me, and I am going through something right now. And I thought, all right, Lord, how am I going to rejoice in this? But he, he allows us to find that joy. And as we serve the Lord and look that Christ is coming to take us home one day, uh, we can be joyful. Another scripture in Romans 12, 12 the Romans 12 has a little section on how to behave as Christians. And if you read that, you'll learn how you're supposed to behave each day. And I thought that was cool. But anyway, it says we are rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Now, and if anybody knows me, I'm not a super patient person. I want the things that were done yesterday. I want tomorrow's things done yesterday quite often. But we are to be joyful in the Lord. That's the bottom line. When we are having tribulations and trials, that is the bottom line. And then the last one is uh, in James, count it all joy when you fall into various trials or tribulations. I am praying that someone today is getting a blessing from this because quite often we go through things and we keep it to ourselves. But you can go to the Word, and you can have joy in knowing that you are walking in Christ's grace, and that one day we'll have that eternal life. And so this was a, I, I maybe this is, lesson was for me, but I'm praying that you understand that we are to have joy, not only in tribulations, but in every moment that we're living. So I praise the Lord. Everybody have a great day, and worship. God is our king, so enter into worship. Amen. Well, one thing I didn't mention. Hey, John, how's it going? Okay. Man, this morning is something. I'll tell you what. Sometimes they just all come together, and sometimes they just don't. <laughs> Praise God. But uh, uh, we are getting ready to do our BGMC. One thing I wanted to mention, it's not Owen's birthday, but he did break his arm, right? He broke his arm, poor guy. And uh, when I found out about that, I thought, man, it's, he can be a part of my club now, right? If you break 23 more, you and I can be buddies, right? <laughs> Okay, you got a good start going. Get Dad to get you a motorcycle. That's what took care of mine, okay? <laughs> Praise God, but we're praying for you. I hope you get well soon. Not much is going to keep that kid down, I'll tell you that, as his dad, you know, you know <laughs> totally agrees with that. We're now going to do BGMC, which is our Penny March uh, Boys and Girls Missionary Club. They, uh, this Penny March uh, is done all over the nation, and the amount of money that is... Um, received four missionaries to go to their work is absolutely amazing. And what our kids do uh, is amazing, and it, and it helps them learn how to give and how to be a part uh, of these missionaries' lives and their ministries. So I'm going to pray over this offering, and, uh, and then the girls and boys will come on up. You'll uh, put the money in, and we'll see whose ways more. Amen. Heavenly Father, praise and thank your name. Lord God, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for these missionaries that have chosen to go out into 
other nations, other countries, some within our own country, even within our own state, and go into places that others won't go, places that you've called them to. Father, to give up a lot of the luxuries of life so that they might serve you in the way that you've asked them, Father. And Lord, I just pray that you be with them, that you be with their families, that you bless this offering, Father God, that it go towards them, their ministry, and them reaching people for you, Lord God, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, and for all of our missionaries who have kids uh, that have went with them, they're missionaries too. And Father, I pray you be with them and encourage them and let them be bold as they stand for you. Heavenly Father, just bless us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, come on up. We have boys right here, the blue, and the girls right here in the red. I'm going to make sure you know this is the boys, okay? I think we're going to have a little bit of trouble here, guys. Here we go. Yep. The girls took it, no doubt. The girls not only have a box of coin in there, there's also checks floating around in there. You guys, man, absolutely amazing. No, no, Nikki has been at destroying the boys in this contest for quite some time. And we thank her for her faithful commitment amen you know Nikki it's okay it's 2024 now and you can identify however you'd like so next offering if you'd like to identify as a boy let's do it okay praise God <laughs> he didn't just say that did he yeah I did praise God the morning's already off to a rough start let's go ahead and finish her off guys as we get ready to go into worship today, um, this, this sermon is going to be a little different than you're used to hearing me speak. And, uh, and Judy kind of set me up there. He's been preaching some really good ones, and now I'm going to throw you a curveball. It's different. But as I've said before, the Lord has really been after me to do things in a little bit of a different way and to bring us back to square one and begin to build because who knows that church and denominations and theology and doctrines and all of these things can get pretty messy. They're like Christmas lights. And at some point you just stop wanting to try to unravel them. It's just too much. So we're going to go over some basic stuff today, but it's going to, the second sermon to this, which will be preached next week, the, ser the second part We'll bring it all together in a way that I hope you can really appreciate. So hang with me today and please listen because I'll guarantee you one thing. None of us have it all figured out. None of us do. And if anybody here has it all figured out, please see me after service because it's a, it's a messy world. It's a messy life. But we know who our Lord and Savior is. We know what He said and we need to make sure we understand it in full context because that helps us begin to move forward in him so today you have the opportunity to worship the king let's worship him worship it dare to worship god today as if he is who you tell other people he is amen let's worship the king
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who. Trust. 
through trials um, and struggles. Um, you know, I get a vision of like a, a trail. Um, anybody who knows me has know that I've spent a lot of time in the mountains um, when I could. And uh, I get this picture of a trail and there's huckleberry brush and one-way brush. Your journey students will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's, you, you start going up this, this steep hill brush that's coming against you and it's called one way brush because the only way you can go is down <laughs> um, but we're trying to get to the top and it's up against us and we're, we're fighting through it and we're having to pull it out of our way and um, it seems like we're not making any progress on our own but then you, you come around the corner and there's an opening and you're able to hit a trail and just go and I want God, I feel like God is saying this morning that no matter what your circumstance is, no matter how thick the brush feels, um, no matter how intense the trial is that you're going through, that he has never let you out of his hand. He's never let you out of the palm of his hand. And you've, he's been with you through every step, and he wants you to know that as, as you're going through this, don't rush but rest in his presence in the midst of this trial because we can be thankful for the, the trial because he's using it to grow us and form us and mold us into a beautiful creation. And God has always been faithful, and I feel like that is something that somebody needs to, to hear this morning and be reminded of that God has never, ever let you go, and he has always been faithful. He always will be.
Heavenly Father, we praise your name in this place today. Father, we thank you for your promise, for your goodness, for all that you bring us, Lord. Father, I ask today, Lord, that all of us in this place, Father, that our hearts would be softened, and Father, that our ears would be open to hear your word, and Father, that we would begin to approach you in a new way to approach the study of your word in a new way. And Father, I pray all of us here, everyone has something, something that's a weight that is heavy, something that they feel like is crushing them at times. And sometimes it's tough to just get from one day to the next. Let us all remember that this is not our burden to carry, that you have told us that you will handle it, that you will take care of it. All we have to do is breathe deep and follow. So Father, I pray for anxiety, stress, all of these things that may be affecting some this morning, Father, that we remember that you will take that from us and it is not our burden to carry and that only the answer will be found in you, only you. So Father, I pray as always, the word that you've given me, Father. Let it be your words, not mine, and let it be said in your tone, not mine, so that we might all learn and that we might all grow and walk out of here different. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 I found the way I can combat my glasses is a bigger font. Praise God. I've went from 12 to 14 to 16, and I think I'm getting ready to make the jump to 18. We're going to give it a try here. So the title of the message today is Read the Small Print. And like I said before, I want you to 
Stay with me on this. It's really one that if you'll come back next week, we'll tie some things together. Now, when I went to Bible college, I began to quickly see that what I knew as, as the Word of God, as, as a newer Christian, who I knew God to be, the Scriptures seemed to kind of mess it up and contradict it in ways as they were taught to me. Now, anybody here who is it was younger, you big horn guys and girls, anybody who's doing studies right now, you can look at stuff sometimes and think, that's not the way it is. I'm going to push back against this because after all, I'm 20, 21, 22. I've got life figured out. And I actually know everything about God as well. So this is a position I found myself in. And I had no idea how shallow my end of the pool was. Now, in my heart and in my spirit, I pushed back against things because they just didn't line up with who I know my God to be. But there is so much value in knowing how to properly study the Word of God. Now, most of this is a sermon I heard years ago that I kind of put some notes together and followed along with. I'm going to put my own spin on it today. We love movies at my house, and the new Willy Wonka movie is out. And so we decided to rent it. By the way, a great movie. Absolutely loved it. But this clip came on, and immediately I began to think about those notes I had previously taken. Read the small print. Here is how this hit me. There is no greater way to get to know God and to know His character, His nature, His goodness, the life that He has for you than reading and studying His Word. Yet most people don't do it. Why? Some, be some believe it doesn't apply to them. Some believe it's a, it's a waste of time. Others try to read it, and they get confused and just give up. In my experience, the biggest problem isn't necessarily the desire to read it. It's not knowing how to even get started. When, when I came to really know the Lord, I had a Bible. Now, my mom had gotten me to church anytime she possibly could, but most of the time, I was racing motorcycles and wearing casts and whatnot like Owen. So I had a somewhat of a belief structure in place. And my mom had taught me quite a bit. But when I came to really know the Lord, I began to read the Bible. I was excited about what God had done in my life. I was excited about where He had removed me from. I could feel Him. I knew Him. He was there with me. It was powerful. But that's not where you're supposed to stop. So I started reading, and Genesis was... Interesting. And Exodus got kind of exciting. 
And then we got on Leviticus, and I quit. I'm out. I'm done. The Bible's crazy. It's nuts. It's boring, and I want nothing to do with it. So I'm just going to continue this journey with God, but I don't really need to read all the begats and all of that stuff, right? Thank you. <laughs> At that point, a new Christian begins to seek quicker ways to get the answers they want. And older Christians are more than happy to show them, and that doesn't always go that great. Anyone ever been shown the age-old practice of flipping through the pages of the Bible, sticking your finger on a verse and then applying it to your life? See, it's great when you hit the right verse. Man, you're flipping through it and boom. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Praise God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And most of the page flippers that I saw would do a lot of flipping and Oh, well, I slipped on that one. Let's go ahead and go again, right? Let's flip again. Oh, darn it, sticky fingers. It's not a great way to do it. Because what if you're flipping through the Bible, and let's say you land on Ezekiel 4.12, and you shall eat it as a barley cake, baking it in their sight on human dung. What are you going to do then? Right? It's, <laughs> it's a cop-out. Because the Word of God isn't a magic eight ball, guys. It's not just something we crack open and try to find a Scripture that we think can apply to where we are currently at. That's not the best method. Because the Word of God is living, it's active, and it is powerful. It will speak to you. It will guide you, protect you. It will empower you. It will guard you from temptation. It will renew your mind, build your faith. And it is the truth that sets you free. It is the key. The truth that sets you free. So knowing what it says and does not say is important. Now, this is very near and dear to my heart because someone who was not raised in church, someone who spent some time walking around the wrong direction and then came to know the Lord was very disappointed when I found His church. I was disappointed because I'm looking at the things that they're saying, the things that they're talking about, the shallowness with which they're doing it, and I'm like, I'm coming to you so that I might get some help. And all I'm finding is quite the opposite of what I'm feeling and what I know to be in this Word. It wasn't the right structure. So we're going to do this. Some of this you've probably been through. Those of you that are currently in college or have taken some courses on how to study the Bible, you're probably going to be like, I would have been, I already know this stuff. I know how to do this. I, I've been doing this since the Nixon administration, some of you older people are saying. I've got this. I don't need to hear this. Yes, you do. We all need to hear this. Because we are a pretty healthy body. This is a healthy church. When people ask me, how's the church going? I say, it's healthy. And I praise God for that every minute. But you know what? It doesn't take much to turn the corner to unhealthy if you do not understand how to read the Word of God. So five things we're going to focus on today. Choose a translation you understand to start with. Choose a time, a place, and a plan to study. Understand the context. Understand the context. Understand the context. Read slowly and ask questions. Pray for God to speak to you and apply what He shows you. Not what you have predetermined He is going to show you. We're going to use a passage of Scripture to walk through how this process works. We're going to start in Philemon chapter 1, verses 7-8 through 8, in the King James Version. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. 
Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Oh boy. Oh boy. I start, I start with that, and I read that personally in the King James Version, and I'm like, oh, I think I forgot to feed the dogs, right? I don't like the way it flows. I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Why it's important to choose a translation you understand. And before you start throwing things at me and saying that the newer translations are, don't apply and that they're shallow and that, no, that's not true. Choose a translation you understand. So why are there different translations? The Bible is written in three original languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Bible scholars who translate a word in Hebrew try to choose the best and most accurate words to reflect the original intent or meaning, and so on and so forth. But language changes over time, doesn't it? When the King James Version was translated, it was the year 1611. 1611. Pat, do you remember when that first Bible came out? A few things have changed since then. And they're constantly changing. The world is constantly changing. How we talk is constantly changing. In my day, you were awesome. Something was cool. And in my son Darren's day, you're lit. And that meant something completely different when I was his age. <laughs> that meant you didn't want to get near mom and dad. So when you read, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, that's gross. <laughs> to me, that's gross. But at the time, it was thought that humans felt their emotions in their bowels. Today, it would be in their heart. Same intent, but much different language, isn't it? Because you wouldn't sing to your sweetheart, I give you my bowels. <laughs> or wear a shirt that says, I left my bowels in San Francisco. <laughs> it wouldn't make sense, would it? You say, well, the word's older, so it must mean more. Stop it. It doesn't. I've ran into people that are so hung up that you, it better be the King James Version or I'm not even coming to that church. I guess they like their bowels to be refreshed by the. I've been asked several times about the translations I use. I use translations that I feel are accurate, but also that can be understood. And I'll usually use the New Living Translation or the ESV and sometimes the NIV. And today I used KJV because they are a more current language. It's more understandable. In Philemon 1.7, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Doesn't that roll off the tongue better? I understand that. I hear that. I, I can see what they're saying. And you can use other translations, but here's the key to using other translations. You need to study it, not just glance at it. Because if you'll study the Word of God, you'll begin to drill down to where they got that interpretation, where they got that Bible from. But if you just glance at it and read it and take it at face value, you're going you're gonna to create a really big problem for yourself, and eventually you'll create a problem for others as well. Because you can't just... Look at a scripture, read it, put it on your refrigerator, and live it. You need to know what it means. Also, choose a time, a place, and a plan to study. A consistent time and place to study the Word of God. If possible, I like to study in the morning. And I like this because it causes you to align your day with the Word, not align the Word with your day. 
That's a very important distinction to make. See, it's easier to study forgiveness before the offense happened than after. See, before you leave your house, if, if you have prayed and studied and understand what God is telling you about not picking up offense, about loving someone, that when someone rubs you the wrong way or says the wrong thing, your heart is already, I'm sorry, your bowels are already prepared. Prepared to receive that. Prepared to show the love of Jesus. Now if you don't, and let's say you're an evening studier, and that happens and you pick up the offense, what part of the Word of God do you think you are not going to study? I don't want to know anything about forgiveness because I have no intention of forgiving. So the morning, to me, is an important time to do it. Choose a place. Your favorite chair. For me, it's the couch. My dogs jump up there and study the Word with me. I get a cup of coffee. I'm in my Snoopy robe that my son gave me. I'm living the dream. That's my spot. That's how I choose to do it. It's how I want to do it. Pray about it and find out how you should be doing it because it's very rare that I run across anyone, including myself, that is disciplined enough to make sure that they are choosing a place, choosing a time, and being consistent in their study and prayer. You might like a Bible. You might like paper. I don't go for the electronic stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this Bible. That's fine. And, and maybe digital is what you like. Well, most of my study tools are, are digital, and that's okay too. Just make a plan. No matter what you're using, make a plan. Get a devotion. If anyone here doesn't know what version is, the version Bible, it's a free app, and it's incredible. The study guides, the tools it will give you. And here's number three. Man, I love this one. Understand the context. Why is that so important? What if I told you that a few years ago I went on a week-long trip to Southern California with a woman that was not my wife? We shared a hotel. We had dinner together. We rented a Jeep Wrangler to let the wind blow through our hair. We even went to Disneyland. Oh, no. What is pastor doing? How could he do such a thing? The statement raises concern if you don't know that the beautiful blonde I was with is my daughter, Kayla. Context. Understanding the details. The most dangerous thing in the church today, in my opinion, is incomplete context not fully understanding and studying and working back to what the word of god is telling you and so much harm has been done from the lack of study and the incomplete context because remember the context does not come from your denomination it's not how you've always been taught and told it doesn't come from what your circumstance is in need of at the time. It comes from truth. It comes from study. It comes from understanding the details. Till the day you leave this earth, you should never stop searching the Word of God. And I would challenge you to search the very things that you think you know the most about. Because God will unveil things. Now, you know that I've got a Bible here. I have an iPad. And I also have my favorite book of all time, Where the Sidewalk Ends, by Shel Silverstein. I read this book many, many times at the school library. And here's one that he talks about when he talks about searching. It says, I went to find the pot of gold that's waiting where the rainbow ends. I searched and searched and searched and searched and searched and searched 
And then there it was, deep in the grass, under an old and twisty bow, bow. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine at last. What do I search for now? You think you found the pot of gold. You think you've searched long enough and maybe you've been a Christian long enough and you've read enough that you've searched enough. You can never search the Word of God enough. There are so many amazing things in this Word. Context matters. And the Bible really is a library, not a book. It's a collection of 66 different books written in three languages across three continents over a 1,500-year time period by 40 different authors from shepherds to farmers to doctors, fishermen, priests, kings. It's a collection of poems, prophecies, letters, laws, histories, and biographies written by people and inspired by God. Get this last part. Telling one unified story that shows us our need for Jesus and teaches us to become like Him. To study, understand, and apply what we read in the Bible today, you should always ask three questions. Who wrote it? To whom was it written? And what is its purpose? And we're going to start with Philemon for our context today. Philemon 1, 1 through 2. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, and to the church that meets in your home. This gives us context. We know that Paul wrote it. And if you want to study and, and, and dig a little deeper, you'll find out that it's the shortest letter that he ever wrote. He referred to himself as a prisoner of Christ. If you study, you'll find out that this is notable because he usually refers to himself as an apostle. He's not, he's not pulling rank here on Philemon. He's emphasizing their friendship. And we can find out why if we go a little further. Philemon was written by Paul from a Roman prison to a wealthy man named Philemon who led a church in his home. And if you keep going, you will discover that it was written about Onesimus, a runaway slave who had stolen from Philemon. We'll know that Onesimus met Paul in Rome, and Paul led Onesimus to Christ. Paul's purpose was to encourage Philemon to forgive this slave, Forgive the runaway slave and accept him as a brother in Christ. Seems simple, but that was a really big ask. And how do we know that? Because if you research that time period, you find out that when a slave ran away, they were at the very least literally, physically branded as a fugitive. But they were usually beaten to death. And Paul's going to say, the guy who stole from you, who escaped, I want you to forgive him and treat him as an equal, not a slave. See, understanding the context allows us to read the Scripture differently. We can see that Paul in this passage, he's, he's not referring to himself as an apostle. He's not demanding that he do this. He's He's turning toward his good nature. He wants to try to influence him through their friendship. Philemon 1, 4, 5, and 7. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Paul is saying, Philemon, because of you, because of who I know you to be, I know that you will do what is right. 
He could have demanded, he could have, he could have set himself up as the Apostle Paul in the letter, and he could have told him, what you're doing is wrong, and you are going to forgive this individual, but he didn't. So you can begin to get some context and understand maybe the relationship that he had with him, that Paul had with Philemon. The fourth thing is read slowly and ask questions. What does this say about God, and what does this say to me? Now, I didn't make this acronym. It's called SPEC. It's been around for a long time, and it talks about things to ask. When you read the Word of God, is there a sin to be avoided? Is there a promise to be claimed? Is there an example to follow? Is there a command to obey? And is there something to know about God? Now, today's the setup. Next week, there'll be quite a different message. God has, has impressed upon me so deeply, so deeply that that his people, that his church stands up and talks so often about watching out for false teaching, about being vigilant, about keeping your eyes peeled. And some of the very people that I hear speaking this, be careful, watch out for the false teaching, are often the false teachers. See, if you do not know the Word of God, if you do not understand where it came from, why it was written, who it was written for, what it's about, you will be caught off guard because you will not understand the very message that you proclaim to others. You've got to know it. Say, well, I, I don't want to study. I've never really been good at that. I've never really... If you love something you'll make time for it. If you love something, you'll make time for it. You know, I challenge myself to replace some of my time flipping through Craigslist on things I'm never going to buy and maybe read a devotion. You study the Word of God. You say, why is that so difficult to do? Because it's so powerful. And you know the enemy knows that. The enemy of your soul knows that if you get a hold of that word and you actually know what it means, that you're going to be very formidable. He would rather you, you took your information from YouTube. He would rather that you found someone else to do the study and the work so that you might glean a couple of comments and a couple of scriptures and run with it. God did not intend that. He did not make a pastor someone that comes up and holds a microphone and tells you every little bit of what the Word of God means so that you don't have to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it or we'll always swim at the shallow end. And that brings shallow accusations and that brings shallow problems and that brings some of the things that the church suffers with today that we, we should not. Choose a translation you understand. A time, a place, and a plan. Understand the context. Read slowly and ask questions. And pray for God to speak to you and apply what he shows you. Pray. What do you want me to see, Lord? Lord. What are you saying to me? As I go into that building today and, and Pastor Chuck gets up there and grabs the microphone and, and begins to, what is it you're trying in the scriptures that he is using? Because it is no mistake you're here. God knew you would be here. He knows what you need to hear as much as he knows what I need to hear. Pray to him and ask, what am I supposed to get out of this? And the biggest, don't come in with a preconceived notion that you understand and that you know. 
well, I've already been down that path. I've already done that. I understand. I understand what I'm doing. I have the, I have the power. I have the authority. I, I statements. Get away from them. God has the power. God has the ability. Through Him you can do all things. If you catch yourself saying I, get rid of it. Humility is one of the biggest things you need to truly understand the Word of God because you can't know it all. And if you think you understand it, you don't. Not fully, but you should be in love with the search. What are you saying to me? Philemon 1, 8 through 10. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. One thing before I continue, I want to back up to. An old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, not a prisoner of Rome. Paul knew he was where he was supposed to be, even when it looked like he wasn't. Onesimus stole from Philemon. He runs to Rome. He meets Paul. Paul leads him, a slave, to Christ. What does that mean? What, am, what, what does that story speak to me? Now Onesimus is not a slave, but a son. Go deeper. In the original language, there's a little buried treasure here. Onesimus' name means useful or profitable. Paul uses this in Philemon 1.11. Formerly, Onesimus was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and and to me. As the worship team comes back up. Formerly, a slave was useless, but now he's useful. What is God saying to me? He's saying, your life was formerly lacking. Painful. You were a slave to sin, but now it is profitable. Amen? You were a slave to sin, but you are no longer now your life is profitable. The application, what is God showing you? Think back to how God used something you didn't want and made it useful. So many times, I walked through things I didn't want to walk through. Things that I could not imagine were going to end well. And somehow, out of that mess, God turned it around and made it profitable. God is writing your story as you speak, as I speak. He's writing your story. Maybe you, formerly you were addicted, but now you're becoming sober and clean. Maybe formerly you were depressed and anxious, but now you can have peace. Formerly your marriage was hanging by a thread, but now you are seeking God together. Formerly you were lost, but now you are found and set free. Amen? See, this shouldn't only be exciting on Easter. If you get into the Word of God and you fall in love with Him, this stuff gets exciting enough to yell about. Praise God. We sit just like sticks. It just it blows me away. On Easter we come in and we yell, well, praise God, He's risen from the dead. Jesus came to save us. Roll the stone away. I'm going to pay for a good lunch today. We get super excited. And then we come back the next week and we're stale and we're staring and we're not grabbing a hold of God in the way we did the week before. And instead of going to Quinn's, we go home and make a pizza pocket. We go back, not forward. 
That's what, it's hanging in the balance right now. Those that will choose to have humility and choose to begin to truly learn the Word of God and not go just by what they are told, but what God said, you'll fall in love with Him. You'll fall in love with His Word. And all of a sudden, He will be all you can think about. It will change everything. It's not easy, but it changes everything. Formerly formerly you were lost, but now you are found. See, God will begin to rewrite your story as soon as you begin to read His. You want your story rewritten? Take a look at the one that's already there. It's full of advice. It's full of amazing insight that it can begin to rewrite your story. But first, you got to read his. We're going to get more into this. Next week's going to have a little bit different of a tone to it. But God's pressing me that if we're going to be a part of something big, if you're going to if you're going to be a part of this family here at Church on the Move and and we're going to see the revival that everybody wants to see and and we're going to see God move in a new way and and we want everything everything to be to begin to be rewritten that first of all we've got to read his story to understand what he's about to do Because I'm telling you what will happen. We have many good churches in this community. We pray for them and for their Sunday services. Because we're all in this together trying to share the love of Jesus. But what's going to happen is when God really shows up, when God really begins to move, if you're not familiar with who He is and what His Word says, you will find a reason to walk out those doors. You'll find a reason, a blame. But that's on you, not God. That's on you, not me. I'm sure things that I say, I don't always say things that people like. Praise God, that means I'm actually trying to do this right. Because God offends me every single day. But the more I get to know His Word, the more the relationship deepens and the more I realize and you're rewriting my story. You're rewriting my story. You've got to read the small print. Get the study guides. Understand the context. Who is He saying it to? Why was He saying it? to understand who he is. So that's my challenge. I'm going to challenge you this week to find a translation you understand, to choose a time, a place, and a plan, to try to understand the context, to read slowly and not be afraid to ask questions, and pray for God to speak to you and apply what he shows you come back next week we'll continue this if we grab a hold of this guys we probably can't even fathom what's going to take place Heavenly Father praise and thank your name Father I pray that you be with us today Father that you challenge us to read your word to study it to find the appropriate context. Father, allow us to be humble enough to ask questions. And Father, let us begin to grow in you. And as that relationship deepens, Father, as you prepare us for what you are going to pour out, what a wonderful time we have ahead of us. Help us to be disciplined. Help us to be humble. And help us to seek you. Because all of the answers, they come from you. The truth, 
comes from you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We praise you and honor you and glorify you today, Lord. Be with everybody here, Father. Pull us together, tight as a family, so that we don't give the enemy any type of foothold to step in and cause any type of contention, but that we learn together, we grow together, and we walk together exactly like you intended it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
goodness.